Positive Spin, presenting positive, innovative, and solution-oriented news from around the world. On today's show, we give focus to three organizations that are working to address the underlying issues associated with gun violence. The Meta Center for Nonviolence, the Peace Alliance, and Peace Love Studios. We end the program on an uplifting note with a music video by Stuart Hoffman entitled, You Get More Beautiful. In our first segment, we hear from Bill Baskin, president of the Peace Alliance, a national and multi-generational advocacy and grassroots organization working to transform how we confront violence both here and around the world. Mr. Baskin will share his thoughts about the Peace Alliance work to reduce violence. He'll also put into context the recent shootings in Newtown, Connecticut, and let us know what we all can do to come together to create a more peaceful society. Hello. I'm very pleased to be here representing the Peace Alliance and speaking about these critical issues. Just turn on the TV news if you need reminders of why we've got to work together. Individuals, communities, countries, and yes, even the world, to change the way we all deal with conflict. Let me give you a few sobering statistics. During the 20th century, more than 100 million people lost their lives to war, and most we're non-combatants. As has been said many times before, war is not the answer. That's why internationally, the Peace Alliance works with a number of key partners and coalitions to ensure that peace building is an important part of U.S. foreign policy. Specifically, we actively advocate for federal funding of the U.S. Institute of Peace. The conflict stabilization operations at the Department of State which funds the Civilian Response Corps and a new bureau that focuses on preventing deadly conflict by assessing and planning an effective response to countries struggling with or at risk from conflict or civil strife. And a complex crises fund that can make available unprogrammed money to be used in the case of an emerging or potential conflict without having to wait for the bureaucracy to take its time. As well, we continue to support creation of a U.S. Department of Peace Building, which is expected to be reintroduced early this year in the 113th Congressional Session. Now, in the U.S. alone, according to an analysis conducted by the prestigious Institute for Economics and Peace, we spend nearly $2.2 trillion annually for violence containment. $2.2 trillion. Here's another. Homicide is the second leading cause of death among young people aged 12 to 24, and it's number one for African American youth. The U.S. has nearly one quarter, that's 2.3 million, of the world's prisoners, even though we have less than 5% of the world's population. And then came Newtown. 20 young kids and six educators lost their lives. It was just the latest example of how violence affects our lives and punishes innocent victims with no logical explanation or rationale. Newtown affected me personally. I was born and raised in Connecticut and know the Newtown area well, and I have been touched by violence personally. We lost a daughter to a violent murder 17 years ago, which remains unsolved. Life goes on, but she's always in my thoughts. And in the thoughts of the two small children she left behind. Now the president spoke eloquently and emotionally for the nation that day to express our sadness, sympathy, and prayers to the people of Newtown. Afterward, Representative Carolyn McCarthy of New York whose own husband was shot to death and son wounded on a Long Island Railroad train in 1993 spoke. She noted something the president said, that now was not the time to talk about gun control. She said she agreed with the president. It was not the time to discuss gun control then. It was long before these innocent children, their teachers, and their families became victims of another mass murder. One more statistic that just floored me. 
According to Lawrence O'Donnell, exactly three weeks after this tragic event in Newtown, there have been 409 additional gun deaths. How can that be true? Are there no lessons to be learned? One approach we're very excited about at the Peace Alliance is a bill proposed by Representative Bobby Scott of Virginia. It's called the Youth Promise Act, Youth Prison Reduction Through Opportunities, Mentoring, Intervention, Support, and Education Act. It would provide funding for innovative best practice efforts at the community level, chosen by community leaders, not the federal government. These programs must utilize evidence-based prevention and intervention practices that engage and divert youth proactively before they slip into cycles of violence, incarceration, and despair. These community-based practices have been shown to reduce rates of violence more effectively and at a substantially lower cost than criminal enforcement and incarceration. But it's time for our elected leaders to say enough is enough. How do we get them to act? The issue of gun violence must be addressed, but let me be clear. It is only part of a bigger effort that needs action aimed at changing attitudes about how best to resolve conflict. We need a massive and concerted effort to make positive, proactive, and solution-oriented peace-building methods a national and global priority. There needs to be a shift away from the more punitive, militaristic methods for which we typically reach when dealing with conflict to a more restorative prevention and intervention approach. And we need to continue to grow a robust peace movement fueled by engaged activists who will rise up as a strong counterbalance to the powerful vested interests working to maintain the status quo. The Peace Alliance will continue our work to establish greater infrastructure in our federal, state, and local governments to bring this work to scale through education, advocacy, and mobilization of our growing 70,000-plus grassroots network. And that's where you come in. We need to practice peace building in our own lives and instill it in our kids. But each of us must also bring pressure on our elected leaders to convince them that that's what their constituents demand of them. The most effective language these officials understand is, hi, I'm a constituent, and I support this or that. So, call, write, petition, and even protest if necessary to let them know how we expect them to act. Perhaps then we can look forward to a more peaceful and sustainable society for ourselves, our children, and generations to come. Thank you. The Meta Center for Nonviolence has been educating the public for many years on creative approaches to addressing the many problems of violence that are eroding our security. Greetings, everyone. I'm Michael Nagler and I'm speaking to you from the Meta Center for Nonviolence. I want to wish you a Happy New Year uh, and address a question that is on the minds of many of the people that we hear from and that are working with us, and that question is, what are we going to do about this violence? Uh, There have been 61 mass slayings in this country in between the one in Columbine High School in Ohio in 1999 and the recent tragedy in Connecticut, which was in many ways the worst of all. There were uh, 20 of our innocent children uh, were lost in that episode. So what are we going to do about it? Well, we should not do what a lot of our fellow citizens are trying to do about it, which is to rush out and get a gun to defend yourself. The problem is, first of all, it doesn't really defend us. The fact is that you're much more likely to lose that gun to an intruder or, God forbid, have someone in your own family be killed. Secondly, it sends the wrong message. It says people can, are just bound to be violent and the only way you can defend yourself is by using more violence against them. Uh, 
And third of all, it doesn't address the problem. It addresses your problem, maybe, if you imagine that you can defend yourself with this gun, but it doesn't change the fact that the world is becoming a much more violent place. So not to do that doesn't mean we can't do anything. On the contrary, here at Meta, we've been working for many years now on a scheme which starts with what each individual one of us can do and builds that out into a grand strategy that can really change the world, that can really give us safety, security, and the kind of nonviolent future that at heart we really all want and that many of us here at Meta anyway deeply believe in. So it starts with you. It starts with the individual, and that's good news. We don't have to wait for legislators to act. We can, uh, legislators have a lot that they can do. Gun safety is very helpful, as we saw in the parallel case in Henan, China, that took place on the same day, almost the same number of children. Those children were wounded rather than killed. That's, that's a help. But like we said before, it doesn't change the fact that those children were traumatized by violence. So what can we do with, as individuals while we are working on our legislators and so forth? Five things. This is a distillation of a number, some years of work that we've done here at the Meta Center in collaboration with some of our friends elsewhere. First thing is, let's not just get the weapons of violence out of people's hands, let's get the idea of violence out of people's heads. Let's not expose ourselves to the vast amount of violent propaganda that we've come to take for granted in our mass media. I went to a movie recently, it was you know, a fun movie, Barbra Streisand, uh, lots of fun, perfectly innocent, but the trailers, oh, one violent scene after another. It was like 10 minutes of hate. I would forego going to a Barbra Streisand movie if it meant that I had to expose my mind to that kind of violence. And I would recommend that you do that also. Uh, studies have shown that these violent images make us feel worse and make us behave more violently. Studies have also shown that if we fill our mind with positive imagery, it makes us feel better and makes the world more nonviolent. It's just good science and, and spiritual wisdom to boot. So uh, this gives us two things that we can do. One, not expose ourselves to the violent imagery of the mass media. Two, learn everything that we can about nonviolence. It's a very rich subject. We've got a lot of material about it here at the Meta Center that we'll be happy to share with you. That's two things, and they really make a big difference. The third thing is, if you haven't already done so, think about getting a spiritual practice like meditation. That means really contacting the sources of compassion and wisdom inside of ourselves. The fourth thing is get out and interact with people in a more personal way. It's not a coincidence that the people who commit these acts of mass violence have been loners. They feel very isolated. Let's overcome that by interacting warmly with one another, looking for ways to serve, looking for ways to help, uh, just talking to people instead of interacting with them at a distance. Put down your iPhone, go on out to a cafe and sit and talk with some friends. It's been shown that if you go to a farmer's market, you're going to have 10 times more conversations than if you just walk through the line at a supermarket and check out your goodies. So when you've done all four of these things, you're ready to undertake the fifth, which is to assess your own talents and your own passions and ask yourself, how can I engage in the world to make it a better place? This can be pretty bewildering. If you ever have read Paul Hawkins book, Blessed Unrest, you know that there are literally more than a million good projects out there. So what do you do? Well, we've created a very ambitious scheme called Roadmap, which gives you a kind of map of where these issues are in the world, where we can get engaged, how to do it, first of all, by looking for constructive ways to change the picture, and then looking to ways of nonviolent resistance where we have to. That's a very Gandhian scheme. 
but you'll also notice on Roadmap, which you can see on our website, and there's going to be an interactive tool very soon for you to get engaged with it personally and find other people and find resources and so forth. But you'll notice something quite interesting about Roadmap, and that is one of the arcs, one of the major sectors on our scheme is what we call new story creation. The story that we tell ourselves through the mass media is that we're separate from one another, we're basically material creatures, and that we have to get satisfaction in the outside world. Very good for advertising, very bad for the planet, very bad for our personal psychological health. So uh, I hope that you'll come and visit us at the, the roadmap and the Meta Center. You'll see the new story that we're calling a story of belonging that we've created to energize this new picture, that uh, you'll try these five steps, get in touch with us, and let me end again by saying Happy New Year. And I really look forward to working with you to create the kind of new year and the kind of new world that we really want. Thank you very much. In our next segments, we focus on the important work of Peace Love Studios, which uses an innovative approach to addressing mental illness. The organization was founded by artist Jeffrey Spark. Peace Love Studios uses art as a creative vehicle for people with mental illness so that they can creatively express and address their mental issues. This time we're doing it our way. We got a new perspective. It's time for us to make the great. Get in a new direction and play together as a team. Just like a perfect symphony. Our melody and harmony. We'll make it so. It's a big Kaplan. I'm the CEO of Peace Love Studios. So my name is Amy Kinney and I'm the program director at Peace Love Studios. Um, Jeffrey Spar, the founder of uh, Peace Love Studios. There's such social stigma surrounding mental illness that it's not something that you can easily talk about or that you may easily want to admit to yourself. I know my family really had a tough time when I was in the hospital and having a really difficult time. They couldn't talk about it, they couldn't wear a pink ribbon or wear a yellow bracelet and have someone go, you're connected to that. You know, I've been through that too. Mental illness and mental health in general doesn't have that symbol that people can rally behind and get excited about and um, foster a community behind. What happened was about two and a half years ago, Jeff Spar painted that symbol. It kind of became our calling card and we knew the power of that symbol because we saw how it, how it affected people. Sometimes you have to find what's giving you trouble 
and deal with it in order to actually then find the peace of mind. There's no yellow bracelet. There's no pink ribbon. There's no red campaign. For the tens of millions of people and their families who suffer like myself, these are things that we need to celebrate. You know, recovery is something that we need to celebrate. Art and people's stories and um, helping others is something we need to celebrate. And that's what Peace Love uh, strives to do. You know, violence affects everybody. And recently, a dear friend of mine, returning from a uh, fundraising event, was brutally assaulted on the way to her car. She was beaten so badly and left by the assault assailant to just die. She managed to pick herself up, get in her car, and drive with, with her eyes shut to the nearest hospital. Our friend Stuart Hoffman has dedicated this song, You Get More Beautiful, to help in her recovery effort. Now from the album Dance in the Dance, you get more beautiful.
Well, that's our show for today. I'm Bill McCarthy. We hope this program has inspired you to take positive action in your local community to end violence. And we want to remind you that everyone can make a difference. Go out and make some positive news.